thought I'd kick off a new video series on my own version of kitchen table electronic repairs and go through the diagnosis and hopefully the repair of this Pioneer stereo receiver. Now this receiver I got off of eBay about two or three months ago now, and I got it for about $10. This is a Pioneer model VSX820. Has a USB inputs, Bluetooth, all kinds of fun stuff that I want to play with. Uh, this receiver I got uh, mainly to replace the other Sony receiver that I have right now. Starting to get a little bit old and developing a few problems of its own, I decided I wanted to upgrade it. The seller said the unit did not power on, and I decided to take it apart when I got it. Now this is about as far as I disassembled it in order to see what exactly might be wrong with it. The standby transformer could be at fault. There's also some diodes over here that could be at fault. And then there's also a tiny little voltage regulator right here. And as you can see, it's labeled with a 3.3 to indicate that it's a 3.3 volt. My original reaction was why well, I assumed that the standby transformer was most likely fried due to some kind of a lightning strike. Pioneer wants $40 for that transformer, and I haven't really felt like paying them that kind of money. After a couple months, I finally got around to deciding to dig into this thing a little bit deeper. So after tracing out the voltages on this and finding that I have 3.3 volts going to the computer, I'm pretty sure that there, whatever the problem is, is not in this part of the board. But for right now, I've got to figure out why the computer is not turning on the receiver, why it thinks it's not getting power. So I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper, rip off a faceplate here and check some more voltages. Unfortunately, I have to do this when the power is applied to the receiver. And given at this point right here is the primary 120 volts, uh, I gotta be very, very careful not to touch this because <laughs> I don't wanna get fried, folks. Although it might make a pretty funny video for YouTube. However, I would not be able to upload it, obviously. So the other thing I'm thinking about is I suppose there's a possibility that the main power transformer is fried, but I don't know. It seems like kind of a hard thing to believe that this guy got fried and the standby didn't for some reason. Okay, so I've gone ahead and disassembled the front panel from the unit here. The power button over here um, is nothing more than a contact to ground. So we've got a ground circuit coming off of here. And then when you push the button, it, it sends a ground signal down to the standby key, as they call it, which I traced back, of course, to the ribbon cable. So now, I'm back to the main assembly board. Unfortunately, if this ends up being the microcontroller, then that's probably something that I'm not going to bother replacing, which would mean that the whole main assembly is going to have to be replaced. And unless I find one for dirt cheap on eBay that actually works, it's not going to be worth it because I already know that this uh, main assembly is over $100 from Pioneer. So I think it's time to go ahead and crack a cold one open and gonna have to pull that main assembly board back out and do some more checking here. Now when I got this receiver I had looked up some of the protection stuff but at that time I didn't have the service manual to look up and the people that post stuff on message boards didn't give the correct procedures on how to get into the diagnostic codes and see what's actually going on. <clears throat> Part of my assumption that the, that the standby circuitry was, was faulty was because the LED on the power light never comes on when you plug this receiver in. The reason is is because this receiver is actually going into protection mode as soon as you plug it into the wall. The way to bypass this temporarily is the following key code and I'm going to show you that right now. So as you can see the receiver is plugged in here and I have no power. The light's not on, I can't do anything with the button here. So, in order to bypass this, what you have to do is you have to hold the advanced surround button in and the standby button for two seconds. And as you can see, it came on. So in order to display the error code, we're going to go ahead and turn this back on. So we're going to hold the advanced surround plus the standby button. 
and then shut it off right away. And we're gonna go ahead and we're going to hold the preset back button plus the standby on. And here's our error code, DC, and this is the number of times that that error has appeared. So in order to clear the code, you want to hold the standard button plus the standby button for about 10 seconds. It'll come up and say clear with a question mark and you hit enter. OK. Problem is, is that this receiver has a constant fault and so clearing the code does not fix it. Pioneer manual indicates that the DC air code has something to do with the amplifier. So I'm going to have to look at that next and find out if there's something wrong with that. I'm going to go ahead and unplug the amplifier and see if that error comes up again. So I have the amplifier board unplugged from the main assembly board down here. And I also have the output card unplugged from the amp as well. And let's go ahead and see if this receiver indeed turns on. And we have two relay clicks. And our controls work. So I finally figured out what was going on with this thing. I have a shorted MOSFET on speaker A right channel. And what I did in order to determine what I had, if, if any of these MOSFETs were, sh were shorted out or whatever, was I put my multimeter in the continuity test position and I just ran it across the leads like so. All of these had the same resistance except for this one which I've already gone ahead and unsoldered and I'll show you right now what it does. So I went ahead and tore apart another receiver that I had, and this one works perfectly fine, but I just don't really have much use for it, unfortunately. So I decided to look inside of it and see what kind of transistors it used, and it just so happened to have the exact same part number of transistor that I need to fix this Pioneer. So I went ahead and pulled out the easiest one that I could find to get a hold of, which is right here. And I've gone ahead and installed it right here. So let's go ahead and give this bad boy a test run and see what we got here. The amplifier board has found its way back out of the Pioneer receiver here. Uh, when I put it back in the receiver, uh, everything came up. The DC uh, error went away. And I had speaker output. Problem was, was that the right channel, which is over here, which is also where that transistor was right here that I replaced, um, is producing uh, very minimal audio um, volume level and is also the sound quality is basically that of a blown speaker. So I'm going to take a look at these resistors here and what I found was that um, <clears throat> each one of these is essentially an amp unit, each one of these. So you've got uh, uh, front left, side left, center, side right, and front right. So each one of these is identical in construction and, and adjustments as well. So um, what I did was I determined which one of these cables was the actual output from the amp to the speaker output card right here. The way this is is that the front right channel is this first pin right here. So what I did was I went ahead and traced this back till I got over here. With my continuity checker, I just seeing if there's anything open perhaps. When I got to this bank of resistors, I had no continuity across these resistors at all. So I checked these resistors and I did. I also did with these, these, and these. So these resistors appear to be completely blown. 
So I'm going to go ahead and replace these. Now, since I don't have any of these resistors, and I need to really find out if this is all I have to order, or if there's other components here that are fried as well, I'm going to go ahead and steal the components from the center channel, since I'm not using that right now. I'm going to move these resistors over here, and then we're going to see if the audio quality clears up or not. Now I know the problem exists in this amplifier because the sound quality is perfect out of the headphone jack on the receiver. The other thing I found curious is that uh, the the B speaker outputs down here uh, worked fine. However, the uh, <clears throat> left channel output up here appears to have absolutely nothing coming out of it. This one's fine, but this one's completely dead, and I don't know why. So that may be something that I'm going to end up having to explore on this board, because I don't know if it's something with a resistor here, or a relay, or perhaps some of these capacitors that, are, that live around here. All I know is, is that there's no signal getting out to these banjo connectors on this particular channel, so... That's going to be another fun project to figure that out. But if I can get clear audio out to the beat side, then I know that everything is good and working, and this is the last thing I have to focus on. I haven't had to crack a beer open yet, but if this doesn't work, I may very well be fixing to do so, so we're going to find out. Okay, so I've got the resistor swapped, and I'm going to hit these with some solder here. Okay. Now one of the things I like to do, turn my soldering iron off here, I prefer to use, for any electrical repairs that I make on electronic components, TVs, VCRs, stereos, computers, things like that, I just go ahead and use some of this silver bearing thin wire solder from Radio Shack. And, uh, <clears throat> I like this because the silver bearing is stronger, gives you a better uh, electrical conductivity. I also like the thin wire because it gives you uh, a much cleaner solder uh, because you can control the amount of solder that you actually put onto the area that you're trying to apply it to. So that's why I use it. This stuff is about $7 a roll uh, and you get quite a bit of it on here. It's one, one and a half ounces on this particular roll. So. I love this stuff and you get a lot of projects done with this stuff. Solder joints here that I just did. And we're going to go ahead and put this back together and throw it back in the receiver and we'll see if that took care of our problem. So I've already done a quick test of this receiver and everything's working good on it. Now I've got clear audio on both channels. So now I'm going to go ahead and repair this and I've determined that this relay is, is bad or shorted out or something's wrong with that relay. The relay gets its power from these two pins right here. When the relay engages, it connects these two right here. This is the right channel and the left channel speaker outputs. Now each one of these is the identical relay. So you've got front left, front right, side left, side right, and then center channel over here. All the relays function exactly the same. They're all the identical relay here. You can see. So what I figured out the problem was was that this relay on the left channel here is not connecting these two pins together internally. This one works fine, this one's not. The rest of them work just fine. So since this side of the relay is what's bad, I'm going to go ahead and swap the relay from the center channel over here to this one because this side of the relay is not being used for anything. So it doesn't matter if this side's dead or not because it's not connecting to any speakers. It's only this one that's being used. So if I take this bad relay and move it over to the center channel, take the center channel and move it over to here, I think we'll be good to go on that. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to warm up my desoldering iron there. And we're going to go ahead and switch that around. 
Well, I'm so glad I spent the $15 for this desoldering iron. Because it makes it so much easier than that braid. And so much cleaner. Just suck that solder right up into the tip there and squirt it out. You don't damage the traces. <clears throat> Melts the solder damn near instantly. It's a 45 watt gun, so it does a real good job. And the relay already fell out. Alright, so there's one relay. And as you can see, these relays are completely sealed. I don't see any way of tearing into that without completely destroying the plastic casing in the process. So that's the good one. So let's put that over here. Pull this one out. There we go. And we'll just swap it around. And there we go. A nice, good, clean solder job right there, thanks to that nice fine wire silver rosin core solder. All right, let's go ahead and put this board back in the receiver, and we'll hope that we've got everything taken care of now. Everything's plugged back up, screwed back in, <clears throat> and I am so confident of my repair that I have actually even gone ahead and screwed the heat sink back in down here in the amplifier and all the cables, even though, I still need to replace the resistors that I stole from the center channel amp down here. So let's go ahead and give this baby a whirl. We've got her on. This is cold and flu season, so if you could please refrain from putting your tickets in your mouth as you put your luggage in the overhead, we sure would appreciate that. Oh, wow. My makeshift song antenna. Song radio right now. This is new from the JJ Weeks band. The song is called Let Them See You. Now our inputs are working here. So I think this was a successful repair for the first episode of Kitchen Table Electronic Repairs. Now the only thing that sucks is that I have to get a remote for this unit because things that should be on the front panel such as bass, treble, loudness do not exist and unfortunately those things can only be adjusted with the remote control. Uh, modern receivers, what can I tell you? But we'll deal with that when time comes. Thanks everyone for watching this video and I hope you guys learned something.